it's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the BenQ EW3880R. As usual, there is a written review, which this video is a part of, and you can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. This video is really just to give some nice illustrations, some nice video examples of some of the content that's covered in the written review, but the written review has a lot more technical detail, so if you're interested in that side of things, definitely check that out. And in terms of the examples, I'm primarily going to be showing you in-game examples, a bit of stuff on the desktop, but be aware that what I'm talking about here, what I'm showing you, although I'm giving you in-game examples, it'll apply outside of games. The aspects I talk about with relation to contrast, colour reproduction and that kind of thing very much applies outside of gaming as well. Also be aware that what you see on this video depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately, and very importantly, the screen that you're actually viewing the video on. So in no way does it accurately represent what the monitor looks like firsthand. This monitor uses a 37.5 inch LG IPS panel with a 3840 by 1600 resolution. So it gives you a nice amount of desktop real estate, a large screen area, and gives you an immersive experience when you're gaming, watching movie content, and that kind of thing. So in terms of its multitasking potential, that's very good. You can see how many cells on Excel you can see here, for example. But if you wanted to have things split screen, you still have lots of cells available, lots of space for the internet as well. Or if you want to do a bit of word processing, whatever it is you might be doing. And the pixel density is similar to a 27 inch WQHD 1440p 2560 by 1440 model. So that's a good pixel density. It gives a nice, a nice crispness, decent clarity to things as well. And the ultra wide format can also suit workflows if you have applications which would usually use a lot of horizontal scrolling or if you want to just have a lot of content on the screen horizontally at the same time while still having a window with a bit less horizontal space open. With that in mind, something I often like to do is I like to have a video filling up most of the screen so it captures most of my attention, then have a little bit of section at the end for scrolling the internet for when the video gets a little bit boring. Of course this video wouldn't be boring, it's one of my own videos. A nice thing as well, if you're using Firefox, you can press the picture and picture button, there's a picture and picture function, and that allows the video to fill up even more of the screen without sort of being cluttered by little UI elements and stuff like that. You can also do this if you're watching Netflix or Amazon Prime Video and that kind of thing. I really like that aspect of ultrawides like this, doing this kind of thing. But personal preferences, not everyone will want to do that. But if you watch your content without wanting to use this picture in picture or using an application like the Netflix app and this isn't an option anyway, it will actually fill up more of the screen than you can see with YouTube here anyway, because YouTube has its little YouTube elements, which other applications wouldn't have. And of course, if you're interested in full screen viewing, you can certainly get a screen filling experience with the right content. And that's something which is explored more in the written review and also an article linked there. It's actually the 3440 by 1440 experience, but really it's more about the 21 by 9 aspect ratio and the benefits that brings. So definitely check that out. But there is a lot of content out there on platforms like Netflix and Amazon Prime Video, which is designed for ultra wide aspects like this in mind, and it will fill up the entire screen. On the gaming side of things, that's all explored in the article and also in the written review as well. And some really nice pictures showing a range of game titles with 21 by 9 versus running in 16 by 9 on this monitor. So definitely check that out. I will show you some in-game examples shortly and you'll see the 21 by 9 screen filling experience for games as well. The big thing there is that you get an extra field of view by default. Most games use horizontal plus scaling, which means you'll get the same vertical amount of the game world visible, but you'll get more horizontally. And again, there's some really good comparisons in the written review, in the so-called experience section there. But what I would say is that the compatibility is very good. It does depend on what games you play. Sometimes you might be forced to use 16 by 9. The only title I tested where well, that was an issue was the Outer Worlds. I had to use 16 by 9 or at least a non-21 by 9 aspect ratio. And the monitor does have scaling, as I show you in the OSD video. So it'll give you black bars at the sides. So you don't have to worry about things looking stretched and distorted or anything like that. But for the other titles I tested, that included Battlefield 5, Battlefield 2042, you can see them on my desktop here, Cyberpunk 2077, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Call of Duty Vanguard, they all worked absolutely flawlessly on this monitor with the full resolution and aspect ratio. The curve of the screen adapted to it very quickly, became very natural, really largely forgot it was there. And again, it's exaggerated in videos because I can see on my camera the strange bowing of the screen. It looks like it's pinched in in the middle. But to my eyes, as I'm looking at the screen, 
don't see that at all. It just slightly increases the depth, slightly increases the immersion, and I feel it makes sense for ultra-wide monitors like this. And really the large screen, it did create a very immersive experience. I'm now going to cover the external features of the monitor. So as you can see, they've gone for a bronze coloured matte plastic in place of the usual dark matte plastics or white plastics. A little bit different. I find it blends in quite nicely with the wooden desk and it's a little bit different, so I actually quite like it. There's also that underhanging central sensor unit on the bottom bezel that's used for the BI Plus and the HDRI functionality, which allows the monitor to adjust its brightness and some of the characteristics based on the room lighting, and explore that in the OSD video. The bottom bezel also has a speaker grille texture, and actually does house two 3-watt speakers. There's also an 8-watt subwoofer at the rear of the monitor, and together this forms a 2.1 channel Trevolo sound system, and that is explored in the Features and Aesthetics section of the written review, but just to cover it quickly, I was very impressed by this speaker system. It's one of the best, if not the best, I've come across on a monitor as an integrated solution. Nice punchy sound output, but not overdone, so good clarity as well. A good dynamic nature to the sound, so if you do like to use integrated speakers on a monitor, these ones are definitely up there. There's also a dedicated HDRI button for that function I talked about earlier. The top and side bezels are dual stage, so there's a panel border that blends in quite well when the monitor switched off. You'll see it more clearly when the monitor switched on, as you can see elsewhere in the video. And then there's a slim hard plastic outer component. So this kind of bezel design is very common on modern monitors. As I covered earlier, the screen is curved, and that is something which is exaggerated in photos and videos. It's something which is quite natural when you're just using the monitor. It's quite subtle, actually. It's not a particularly steep curve in this case. The screen surface is what I classify as light to very light matte anti-glare, so that means it does offer good glare handling. Not as good as some matte screen surfaces, but what I mean by that is that sometimes you get this kind of what I describe as a glassy look in places, so you can get some sharper patches of glare or slight reflection if there's bright direct light hitting the screen surface, particularly if you're looking at darker content. In similar lighting conditions, Stronger matte screen surfaces would give you a more diffused look there, more diffused glare across the screen, which can also sort of create this haze and dull things out a bit. As I explore shortly, there are benefits to this kind of light to very light matte screen surface as well. It doesn't impede the light produced by the monitor as much either. Another thing to note is the stand. So that has the bronze colour at the bottom for the base, sort of penguin foot design. Then you've got matte black plastic for the neck. It also gives good ergonomic flexibility, so you can tilt the monitor backwards and forwards, you can swivel it left and right, and you can adjust the height, and the exact measurements for those are given in the written review. I should also mention that the depth of the stand isn't too bad, actually, for such a large screen. And again, measurements for that are given in the Features and Aesthetics section of the written review. There's also a remote which is included with the monitor, so there's an IR sensor built into that sensor unit, which I talked about earlier as well. And this is explored in the OSD video. It's quite a neat little feature, especially if you use the OSD a lot, as I do as a reviewer. At the rear, you can see that subwoofer I was talking about at the top. Matte black plastic, for the most part. Towards the bottom left, you've got the OSD controls, and that includes a little joystick, and that's all explored in the OSD video. The stand attaches centrally, and it screws in with 100 by 100 millimeter VESA screws. There's a little plate, a little plastic plate, which you can snap off. So you just have a knife or a little screwdriver or something at the bottom there, and you can just snap the little plastic plate off. And by snap, I don't mean break it. You just, you just take it off and it makes a nice snap noise. And that will reveal the screws. You do actually need to attach the stand when you first get the monitor and screw it in. It includes a little screwdriver, or my unit certainly did, so that's quite neat. But if you prefer, you can have an alternative 100 by 100 millimeter VESA compatible solution instead of this included stand. Also at the bottom, cable tidy loop. There's actually a plastic port cover that's supposed to cover the port area, but my unit didn't include that, so I can't show you that right now. Just neatens things up a little bit. The ports face downwards. You've got a 3.5mm headphone jack, you've got two HDMI 2.0 ports, you've got display port 1.4. And these ports all support 60 Hz for the native 3840 by 1600 resolution. They also offer HDR support, and that's a static 60 Hz refresh rate. This monitor doesn't have VRR variable refresh rate, doesn't support adaptive sync, so you can't use AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode or anything like that. You've then got a USB-C port, which supports TP-Alt mode. You get 60 watts of power delivery 
and you get USB upstream and that's actually the sole USB upstream port of this monitor so it doesn't have KVM functionality or anything like that. You've then got two USB 3.0 ports which are downstream. You've got your AC power input which means the monitor has an internal power converter and you've got a K slot. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to talk about the contrast experience of the monitor. So this monitor does not offer a strong contrast experience. It's similar to other 38 inch ultra wides or just generally IPS ultra wides actually. So it doesn't have a particularly high contrast ratio. I measured a bit under 1000 to 1 with my test settings. I mean some IPS models are a little bit stronger than that. You also get a moderate amount of IPS glow, a moderately high amount of IPS glow. This is a large screen and it is a viewing angle dependent issue. So it is this haze, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, that emanates from the corners of the screen. In such a large screen, you might see a bit of it towards the top as well as the bottom. It depends on your viewing position. If you're looking down a bit on the monitor, then you'll see it more towards the bottom. I've got the camera mounted quite centrally at the moment and you can see it towards the top as well as the bottom. And it definitely is a feature. So just in general, things do not have a deep and atmospheric look when you're looking at darker content and darker shades don't have that kind of inky look to it, especially if you're viewing in a dark room as I am at the moment. I've now brightened the room up and you'll see that the IPS glow, hopefully you can see that the IPS glow and just the contrast in general, the perceived contrast isn't so bad. Again, you don't get a very good representation on the video of what you'd see firsthand, but you should at least be able to see that the IPS glow is Sort of less distinctive. You will see some glare on the screen and that's something which you don't notice by eye as much as you do in the video. So I can see when I'm looking at my camera preview screen versus the video itself there's a difference there. Now the reason I'm showing you this is if you like to or happen to be sitting in a dark room it is a nice idea to have some lighting behind the monitor, bias lighting, and that can really enhance the perceived contrast. So it could be something like Philips Hue lighting, there are other options there, just to give some light pooling behind the monitor. It really draws away from these weaknesses in the contrast performance. Back to the gloominess again now. The strength of IPS type panels like this is the gamma consistency. So it does have IPS glow as I've mentioned and that will ebb away at some of the dark detail in affected regions of the screen. But you might have heard of black crush on VA models where things are crushed together centrally and then you can actually get excessive detail towards the peripheral regions on VA models. On TN models you have this kind of gradient of detail from top to bottom where there are great changes in the dark detail levels. IPS models are much more consistent in that respect. Yes, of course, you don't have amazing contrast, so you don't get this amazing distinctiveness to the dark elements versus brighter shades surrounding, but at least things are reasonably consistent aside from the IPS glow. It also means that you don't get excessive detail in some regions. You can get on TN and VA models that can give you a blocky or banded appearance, even if your central gamma is correct at 2.2. For brighter shades, I think the monitor represents them nicely. And the reason I say that is that the screen surface is light to very light matte anti-glare, and it doesn't have a clear layered appearance in front of the image, nor does it have any distinct graininess. It actually has a relatively smooth finish, something I'm sensitive to, so I like to see that. And I'm going to cover the colour reproduction of the monitor and to start off I like to use Legom, legom.nl, the website and their test for viewing angles. So the Legom text is nice and consistent throughout, blended grey, mild green striping to the text, no flashes of orange or red, even with a bit of head movement, and that shows that the gamma curve of the monitor has low viewing angle dependency. The solid colours as well, I'm not going to spend too long going through these, they're really just very consistent, they don't have the kind of shift you'd see on TN or VA models. And actually, when you consider some of these, like the red block, it's a nice rich red throughout the screen. It doesn't have the sort of fading towards the edges of the screen, which even some IPS models can show. And given the size of the screen, that's pretty impressive. Be aware that my observations here, they're from my normal viewing position, which is around 70 to 80 centimetres from the screen. But even a bit closer than that, it really does offer good, strong colour consistency. And again, be aware that the video can show things differently to how you perceive things by eye. I'm now on Battlefield 2042 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. This monitor has a wide colour gamut. I measured 94% of the DCI P3 colour space. You'll see that in this representation on the screen now. So there's significant extension beyond sRGB. Games like this, and most content you consume for that matter, 
They're designed with the sRGB colour space in mind, and if you have a monitor with a wider colour gamut than that, it invites extra saturation and extra vibrancy, so things look more saturated than the developers intend. So you could see, for example, there was a lot of extension for various red shades in the gamut, and that does give these earthy browns more of a reddish hue. They're naturally supposed to have a slight reddish hue, but that's brought out more strongly because of the wide gamut, and there's a lot of pop to these red shades here as well. Very eye-catching, a vibrant look, some people like that. Same with the green shades as well, some extension beyond sRGB there, so some of the yellowish greens are brought out a bit too strongly, and they just generally look a bit more saturated than they should. This isn't an extreme boost for the green shades though, it isn't like you'd see on monitors which cover more of the Adobe RGB colour space for example. That can give you a kind of a nuclear, almost cartoonish look to some of these shades. Um, just, you know, re real vibrancy, massive hit of extra saturation. It's a bit more subtle than that, but they're still rather saturated. And even the blue of that fence there as well, it's just more of a striking and deeply saturated shade than it should be. Again, this is something which some people will like, the fire there, very rich as well in the background, but it's not as the developers intend. Also be aware that the colour consistency is very strong, as I mentioned with Legom, so that means that this richness, this saturation is well maintained throughout the screen. So you don't get those kind of shifts in saturation that you'd see on models with weaker colour consistency, typically your TN and VA models. I should also mention here that there's a little bit of oversaturation for the sky blues as well, but that's not too strong. Still quite decent greyish blues, not as strong as on some models, particularly those with more Adobe RGB coverage. If you want things to look more to the developer's intend, a more muted look, then the monitor does offer an sRGB emulation setting. It's called Rec 709. As the name implies, it's more specifically designed to follow the Rec 709 standard, and that does use the sRGB gamut. And you'll find that in color mode, in color. If there's actually a shortcut key, I could have done this a lot more quickly, but there you are, Rec 709. This gives a more muted look overall. On my unit, the gamma is a bit too high, quite a bit too high actually, with the Rec 709 mode. So it also makes things a bit sort of deep and cinematic looking, and that actually gives you an extra saturation to some shades for that reason. But overall, the shades are more muted. You can also adjust brightness with the sRGB emulation setting, but you can't adjust the colour channels and you can't adjust the gamma either. If you look at the start of the colour reproduction section of the Vision Review, I talk a bit more about this. You can also use a GPU level alternative and that will allow you to use the full flexibility of the monitor. So you can adjust the gamma, you can adjust the colour temperature, that kind of thing, and still achieve sRGB emulation done via the graphics driver rather than on the monitor. So if you're wanting to use this monitor for colour critical work or just work where you appreciate a high degree of colour accuracy, or you're just one of those people who likes that kind of thing, then I would recommend full calibration and full profiling using a colour limiter or similar device. But if that isn't an option for you, just use sRGB emulation, and I would actually recommend in this case using the GPU driver option for that. But you will get even better results if you're fully profiling the monitor, you're using colour aware applications as well, that will give you the most accurate results as usual. And with the 94% DCI-P3 coverage, it can certainly be used for colour critical work within the DCI-P3 colour space. Yes, it's not perfect, so it doesn't fully cover the DCI-P3 colour space, but you could see from the representation it was reasonably close, actually. Although I didn't mention it so far, it is explored in the written review, Adobe RGB coverage. That is 86%, that's what I recorded in this case. I wouldn't consider that good enough for accurate representation of colours within the Adobe RGB colour space. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to talk about the HDR high dynamic range performance of the monitor. So I'm using an RTX 3090 a PC connected via DisplayPort at the moment, but I have tested HDR using HDMI. I've also tested with an AMD GPU via both HDMI and DisplayPort, and the experience is very similar throughout. That's not always the case, it's often the case, but not always, so I do like to check this. And I've tested this game title on many monitors, and I know that weaknesses that are apparent here are very much down to the hardware, the monitor. And what I'm showing you as well, it would apply more broadly, so to console gaming under HDR, and also watching HDR movie content, which is something I did on this monitor as well. The monitor has three different HDR settings. So the one I'm using at the moment is my preferred one. It's just called HDR in the menu. If you select Cinema HDRI or Game HDRI, they use the light sensor, so I'm in a dim room at the moment, and that means that the screen's actually going to dim significantly because I'm in a dim room, so it's only going to show you maximum brightness when you're in a bright room. 
It also upsets the image, the HDRI settings in various different ways. So Cinema HDRI, it kind of crushes things together. It looks like the gamma's far too high. It also introduces a very weird cool tint. Things look far too bluish. The game HDRI setting does the same with the blue tint. It's perhaps a bit weaker. And the gamma isn't as messed up, but things actually just kind of look flooded and washed out and it will be adjusting. It'll take a little bit of time for the light sensor to adjust and for it to adjust to the room lighting. But I don't like this at all. It just looks distinctly un-HDR-like. If you like how it looks, then that's fine. Just be aware that you can't manually adjust the brightness. You can't adjust the brightness in any of these settings, actually. So just to show you, you can't adjust the brightness. You can adjust the contrast if you wish, but that's not really going to help you out. You should just leave that at 50. That's optimal. You can adjust the sharpness, things like that. You can't adjust the color mode. You can't adjust the preset. You can't adjust the color channels or the gamma or anything like that. You can adjust AMA, which is the response time setting, but I just leave that on high, which is the optimal, as I'll explore shortly. So anyway, the HDR experience is very basic on this monitor. It doesn't even have VESA Display HDR 400 certification, which is the lowest level that VESA will certify for. All that happens is the backlight stays at its maximum brightness, or very close to its maximum brightness level, regardless of what's happening on the screen. The HDRI settings, they do adjust the backlight brightness slightly according to the image. I say slightly, the main adjustments really is according to room lighting, and I didn't really see much adjustment at all, to be honest, outside of that. The monitor just sticks close to its maximum brightness level under HDR, and that is not particularly high anyway, so the bright shades are not very impressive. I measured around 290 candelas per meter squared as the maximum, so really not HDR-like at all in that respect. The bright elements just don't stand out like they should, and the dark shades as well, they're just not as deep as they should be. The monitor doesn't offer any local dimming whatsoever. It doesn't even use dynamic contrast, so even if the screen is predominantly dark, it's just going to stay at its pretty much maximum brightness level. And that really just gives a flooded look. There's not really too much more to say about that. It's really very unimpressive in that respect. 10-bit colour reproduction is used under HDR, and this improves your nuanced shade variety, so you get a better subtle variety of closely matching dark shades. And not just dark shades, I'm just showing you dark shades at the moment. That helps give a natural uplift of detail, but I have to say that this would be really accentuated if there was precise luminance control, which this monitor doesn't offer, as I've just said. And for the brighter shades, as I mentioned, entirely unimpressive. So this scene here really looks quite flat compared to what it should look like. The 10-bit colour reproduction is again helpful. I'm just going to adjust the camera so this is a little bit more representative of what you'd see. But again, the video is not HDR and your monitor may or may not be HDR capable anyway. So in no way does it represent what you'd see firsthand. But you can at least see that it's not just a giant ball of light there. And with the 10-bit colour reproduction, there are more subtle variations of bright shade, which makes weather effects, mist on the water, smoke effects in the game, that kind of thing, smoother. Smoother gradients, so that's nice. But again, if it had tighter luminance control, it would really accentuate those subtle differences. Meanwhile, the darker shades here, they just look quite flooded. They don't look as deep as they should be, even the medium to dark shades, they're just lifted up higher than they should be. That's not to say it looks completely washed out. I know some monitors under HDR, that the colors and everything can just look bizarre. That's not the case here, thankfully, but really it's very limited on the luminance side and in terms of its backlight control. But it isn't all bad news. In terms of colour reproduction under HDR, the monitor does tick boxes a bit better. So as I covered earlier, 94% of the DCI-P3 colour space, the developers are now targeting a huge colour gamut, Rec 2020, and they have good coverage of the DCI-P3 colour space in mind for their creations to look decent. And this monitor does offer decent DCI-P3 coverage. And things are mapped well within that gamut, so it does make good use of that. The saturation, the oversaturation, is toned down. So I mentioned some shades appeared too saturated under SDR. Lara's skin would be an example of that. Some of the greenish yellows are brought out too strongly. They're more muted under HDR, as they should be, but there's still pops of vibrancy where there should be. There's some good deep greens. Lara's dress looks reasonably vibrant. Some of these dresses as well, nice and colourful as well. Good shades beyond the sRGB colour space being shown here for these flowers as well. But then again, greater Rec 2020 coverage, and that can be seen on some models that have, for example, quantum dot backlights, and they would have greater Adobe RGB coverage. That's a sign that they're going to be having greater Rec 2020 coverage as well. 
they would show greater saturation for some of these shades, but this certainly doesn't look washed out in that respect. Although for some of the medium shades and the darker shades, even when you look at the colours, because of the backlight control not being very precise, it doesn't have as much depth as it should be, and that can really help add extra pop as well. So it's not just about the colour gamut, which is decent here, but also the luminance control, it's all brought together under HDR. So the monitor definitely doesn't provide a true HDR experience by any stretch of the imagination. I'm now on good old Battlefield 5. The reason I'm not on Battlefield 2042 is simply for performance and consistency reasons. It's much easier to control what's going on and control the frame rate on this title. So the game is running at a solid 60 frames a second, and this is a 60 hertz monitor. It's limited to 60 hertz. It doesn't have VRR, variable refresh rate technology or anything like that. So it's really very much about the static 60 hertz experience. As far as that goes though, the monitor does do well. In the written review, there's an article linked to all about responsiveness and there's something called perceived blur, which is explored there. And that is something which is contributed to mainly by your eye movement, but also by the pixel responses of the monitor. And a technique called pursuit photography is explored there. It's also summarized a bit in the responsiveness section of the written review. And this allows you to capture motion on a monitor in a way that reflects both aspects of perceived blur nicely. So this is what I'm about to show you on the screen here. So with this, I conclude that AMA high is the optimal setting. And you'll see that there were two reference screens at the end. One was the Philips 288 E2 UAE, which is a reasonably fast IPS model, a reasonably competent, pretty competent 60 Hertz performer really. And the other, the Philips 328 E1CA, is a reasonably competent VA model. And this monitor outperforms both of those. There's less powdery trailing. There's actually very little powdery trailing behind the objects. And this is something which is reflected more broadly. So the monitor really doesn't have any standout weaknesses within the confines of its 60 hertz refresh rate. It does well. So I could pick up tiny little traces of faint powdery trailing, far too faint to appear on the video, and something which really is only a minor contributor to perceived blur. If you're really sensitive enough to have an issue with this, you're actually likely to have an issue with the 60 hertz refresh rate more generally. There's also just a touch of overshooting places. Again, nothing that stands out in such an obvious way that I can really show you it in the video. And when I'm just playing the game normally, it doesn't stand out to me at all, and I'm quite sensitive to overshoot. So I wouldn't worry about this. The AMA high setting is very well tuned in this respect. I've just briefly switched over to the premium setting just to see if I can show you any overshoot, but you, you can see it really in the test UFO images there, some overshoot in terms of halo trading, which is a bit brighter than the background shade, and also some dirty trading, which is a bit darker than the background shade and can stand out a bit for that reason. I can see it around the clouds here to my eye and also around the wall there. And it's actually quite widespread. It's not extreme overshoot, but to be honest, the high setting is just so well tuned that you don't, you really gain very little using the premium setting. You just gain the overshoot really. So I wouldn't recommend using it. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5. There's not really much more I can show you here to be honest because the monitor does consistently perform well within the confines of its 60 Hertz refresh rate. But this is a scene I like to show just for completeness. It shows more dark shades. So it has shades which many monitors will struggle a bit with. With this one, again, there are minor weaknesses, just a little bit of very faint powdery trailing in places. You can see it, for example, at the top of the makeshift roof, but really, I do stress this is minor. Same with the overshoot, just a trace here and there, nothing which I find eye-catching, and even people who are sensitive to overshoot shouldn't find this problematic. If you're super sensitive to overshoot, you could always use AMA off, and that will slow things down a bit, but it's actually pretty fast still. So you might find if you're super sensitive to overshoot, you can just use that and you'll be perfectly happy with it. That's not a problem. But for me personally, I do like the balance of AMA high here. And so far I've completely neglected to mention input lag, but the good news is that this monitor doesn't have an issue there, it has low input lag. I measured under four milliseconds. That indicates a low signal delay, which is the main element of input lag you feel. So this monitor doesn't have an issue in that respect. But really, if you're super sensitive to latency and somehow this is a problem for you, this slight signal delay, because it's not completely zero, then the 60 hertz refresh rate is going to be too much of a limitation for you anyway. To wrap up then, 
In terms of the styling, the monitor does things a little bit differently because of its use of bronze colour rather than black or white or grey, something a little bit more traditional. I quite like that, found it blended in nicely with the desk. Integrated speakers are really good as well. I actually quite enjoyed using them just to listen to music and that kind of thing. So they're certainly a lot more usable and actually quite nice to use compared to most integrated speaker solutions. I like the little OSD remote as well. Good ergonomic flexibility, height adjustment, tilt and swivel. The curve of the screen adapted to it very quickly, became very natural, largely forgot it was there. It just slightly increases the depth, slightly increases the immersion and I feel it makes sense for ultra wide monitors like this. And really the large screen, it did create a very immersive experience. The pixel density is good, good amount of pixels, good desktop real estate, and a nice immersive experience for watching movies and playing games as well. The contrast experience, nothing to shout about there. Typical IPS model really in that respect. Not quite as strong as some IPS models, but the usual weaknesses. Moderately high amount of IPS glow as well. So certainly not wonderful for deep and atmospheric experience. Screen surface at least was light to very light matte with a good smooth finish, so that was very agreeable to me. In terms of colour reproduction, vibrant colour output thanks to the colour gamut extending quite a bit beyond sRGB. There is an sRGB emulation setting for those who like more muted appearance to things, but that was quite limited in terms of its adjustments except for brightness, and on my unit the gamma was too high there. Very strong consistency from the IPS panel as well, even amongst IPS type panels it was really very good in this respect. So it maintained saturation levels and richness very well throughout the screen. In terms of HDR performance, well, the colour gamut was put to good use, but the brightness, very limited, and there was no local dimming. So really quite a lacklustre HDR experience. I didn't really mention it earlier, but the brightness is quite limited under SDR as well. The maximum was a little bit above 200 candle per meter squared. So not exactly great if you like things to be very bright. Most people, though, when they use their monitor, they will set it between 100 and 200 even if they're in a moderately bright room. So this is going to suit most people just fine anyway. And if you're interested in those kind of measurements with various different settings and that kind of thing, do check out the written review because that's covered there. In terms of responsiveness, 60 hertz refresh rate, 60 hertz static refresh rate, no VRR, but within the confines of that 60 hertz refresh rate, well-tuned pixel responses, low input lag, so a really quite a solid 60 hertz performance. And I found it enjoyable just for single player gaming, a little bit of Battlefield 2042 as well. Of course, I'm used to high refresh rates, but I do have to say I did adapt to this 60 hertz refresh rate over time. But I suspect when I switch back to a high refresh rate monitor, I'm going to really love the experience anyway. But that's just me. That's my sensitivity and what I'm used to. I do think that if you mainly play single player titles and do the occasional multiplayer, you're not too competitive. This can still work fine. So really, there's a lot to like about this monitor, and the price is good. The price is good for a 38-inch ultra-wide as well. It's around $1,000, so I do think it's competitively priced within the category. There are various alternatives from the likes of Acer, LG, and Asus, but most of those are based around an older panel with a much narrower colour gamut. They don't have the BenQ extras either, like the integrated subwoofer, the OSG remote, just little things like that, but certainly the gamut does limit the vibrancy if you like that kind of thing, and would make those options more limited in terms of their HDR colour reproduction. Some of those options also have a high refresh rate, a little bit of a boost to 75Hz, adaptive sync support as well, VRR, so if you're after those kind of things, then perhaps consider them. If you really like the sound of this one in terms of its vibrancy, the BenQ in terms of its vibrancy and that kind of thing, there is the LG 38WP85C. This doesn't have the BenQ editions that I talked about, but it does have USB-C functionality and it uses the same panel as this one. It also runs at 75Hz, it has VRR support. It is a bit more expensive though, it tends to retail at around 1300 USD. Sorry if this is really small and you can't read it, but that does say 1300 USD, which is correct at the time that I'm doing this video. So it could be one to consider. There are also various high refresh rate options, 144Hz, some a little bit higher than that and also some with VESA Display HDR 600 support, but these all retail at a much higher price than the BenQ. So really, that's all there is to the BenQ EW3880R. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.